Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, it's an honor for me to be here today uh, to tell you about my work and also to represent Class 3. And uh, in the next 15 minutes or so, I'll try to tell you uh, what we do. So we are interested in understanding how atoms interact to form a material, and by material I mean a solid, a liquid, or a big molecule, and we want to understand from the way the atoms interact, what the properties at the macroscopic scale of the materials are, because eventually we want maybe to design new materials or to transform materials that are already there to perform the functions that we are interested in. So uh, what do I mean by materials or important materials? Let me give you two examples of materials that I think really change science in society. Silicon. Silicon is a material that it's, uh, you, know, you know, I think that it's in all transistors that we use today. Not all, but you know, m most of the transistors that we use today. And uh, uh, it has really transformed society. It's in all devices, you know, in your cell phones. I'm sure that somebody here must be looking at their cell phones. And, uh, you know, as well as uh, in the fastest computers in the world. And in other materials that we could all agree, even if we are not familiar with the chemical for formula, lithium cobalt oxide, that changed society. But if I tell you lithium ion batteries, then you would agree with me. These are the batteries that you should not really bring on a plane, but uh, you know, that uh, uh, power innumerable devices. Okay, so this is a, 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 as a means of motivation about materials. These are solid materials, but also interface with liquids. Uh, that may be why it may be interesting to study materials. And uh, uh, what we have been interested in in the last 10 or 15 years is to look at the physics as chemistry of material for sustainability and quantum technologies. So what do I mean by that? So first of all, sustainability just defined in a very broad way, sustainable energy sources are those that do not destroy our ability to live on the planet, okay? So we want materials, for example, to harness solar energy and to create electricity or some chemical reaction, I'll get to that, that can help in our quest for sustainability. And this has been talked about very eloquently uh, uh, by, uh, this morning in the opening, uh, opening talk uh, given about climate change. Uh, and uh, among the quest for sustainability is also the quest for clean water. And it's not that water is scarce overall, but you know, it's not distributed evenly. The other interest of ours is in harnessing the power of quantum information, the second quantum revolution, which is about control. Control of quantum mechanical properties of materials and molecules uh, to be able to come up with new computational devices, sensing, new sensors, and uh, new communications. Okay, so what, give, let me give you uh, an example of the question that we asked and that we have asked, uh, you know, over the last 15 years or so regarding these topics. For example, can we design easy to make and cheap solar cells. We know how to make solar cells out of silicon, right? But we want a way of designing cheaper solar cells. Just imagine if you have a material that you can make in, in a very, very cheap way, and then you can put in a paint that you paint on the houses, you know, also of developing country very easily. And, uh, uh, you may want to do more than that and harness the power of the sun and absorb light, not only to create electricity, but to create charges in your materials that then you use to make a chemical reaction to create fuels, for example, hydrogen from water. In regarding quantum technologies, one simple question is, can we take a defect? you know, a missing atom with something else in the material and encode in that defect uh, some information to use it for quantum information uh, uh, application or use other defects like in oxides material to create transitions, small stimulus, big effect, transition of that type that can mimic the firing of a neuron and that we can work, 
can use for neuromorphic application or low power electronics. So how do we address all these questions? So we start from the beginning. So for us, a material is a, an ensemble of atomic nuclei and electrons, okay? And uh, we want to understand how these objects interact, work, and uh, which properties they give rise to. And uh, we want to solve the basic equation of quantum mechanics. There are two equations in my talk, and don't, don't, don't go away. These are the only two equations. And uh, they are the Schrodinger equations. And, you know, uh, it, they are there, 1927, uh, Erwin Schrodinger, he, he wrote them down. We don't know how to solve them. So we are part of a community who uh, has spent a lot of time to try to uh, uh, find and apply approximate forms of quantum mechanics, practical ways of solving this equation that are approximate. And by the way, these two, uh, uh, for the non-expert in the audience, uh, these type of approximation, density functional theory and some quantum chemistry method were considered good enough that uh, two of the inventors uh, uh, won the Nobel Prize in, in chemistry in 1998. And when we have those approximations, we want to do calculation for materials, we need to solve the equation on, on a computer, so we need to come up with ways of efficiently solve them. And, and we have spent quite a bit of time in the last uh, few years to do that, also to describe the interaction of matter and light. I told you we're interested, for example, in, uh, in solar energy, and uh, we have done this using approximation, but one important thing that I want to point out, from first principles, what does it mean based on the first principle of quantum mechanics, using approximation, but without fitting experiments? Not because we don't like experiments, we love experiments, of course, I mean, you know, no, we really do. It's, but we want to be able to be predictive based on the basic equations. Okay, so if you think back about, you know, the questions that uh, I told you that we're interested in, we have to solve those equations, but for multiple properties, we want to understand how ion moves, how electrons behave, how you know, light is absorbed. So there are multiple properties of material that we need to compute all together. We need to couple them. And uh, uh, you know, one of our uh, contributions have been to come up with methods based on many other methods that people, of course, have developed before us to couple them to do what I call to address the mess and connect the dots. So what do I mean by that? Address the mess because if you really are interested in a realistic material, this is disordered. It has defects. It is interfaces with many different things. So we need to be able to understand how a disordered system works and also to connect the dots to put together the multiple property that we are able to compute to solve a big problem. Okay, so again, one of our contributions has been for several properties, for several systems to connect the dots. It, it seems trivial, but it, it's not, you know, in, in, in many instances. Okay, so we started looking at disordered materials, and this is... Uh, our first work where we, uh, you know, the figure that you can recognize is not very recent, uh, you know, the one on the left-hand side. We started by combining the uh, calculation of electronic structure and the movement of ions using a method that has been invented by my mentors and it goes by the name of first principle molecular dynamics. And we apply this for the first time to look at disordered carbons. What disordered carbons? is a mat uh, material where there are atoms that are like graphite, like in your pencils, and atoms like uh, diamonds in your, in your rings. And these are uh, very hard materials that have num numerous applications, and even in the solar energy uh, arena these days. And we understood the network completely from first principle. This was 1989. Fast forward, this is the paper that we have just submitted to PNAS. We actually also now are able to add how the quantum motion of the ions influence how the material conduct electricity. And we think that uh, the way this influence is played will be also important for thermal conductivity. 
So you may say, okay, almost 30 years to do the same thing. Well, in between, we did something else, although we thought, you know, we really like carbon. And uh, uh, so uh, two examples. Uh, we focus, as I said in the beginning, in defects in semiconductor to realize qubits. And again, we developed theoretical and computational framework to address, to address the multiple aspects required to design this qubit to encode information. So what are these multiple aspects? You have to understand how spin defects form. It's not that you have to because, you know, there are samples that are already prepared for you in the experimental lab in some cases, but in other cases you may want to come up with specific defects that will perform the function for you. And so to understand, for example, how uh, atoms form the defects that you want, what are the electronic properties, and also what are the coherence properties. And I'm not going to explain exactly what coherence entanglement is, but think about the properties that you want to control quantum mechanical uh, uh, effects and that you want to be able to harness quantum information. And recently we have been able to do some calculation on materials on quantum computers. And if anybody wants to ask me about that, I'd be happy to tell you what we did on a quantum computer. And usually, you know, for many, many years, we have used classical computer, we still are, and now we are asking the question, what can quantum computer do for us in the fields of materials uh, uh, and chemistry? So these are examples that are really rooted in condensed matter physics, which is my background, and in material science. And over the years, we understood that uh, we could take the same methodologies and also apply them to problems that are more chemistry uh, uh, problems uh, and uh, to other areas. And this is, has been also one of our contribution to take methods traditionally developed in one discipline and also to use it for uh, other disciplines. And we have tried very hard to become, I have tried very hard to become a chemist and I even signed up as a secondary session for section 14 you know, which is the chemistry section. And uh, so, what is the chemistry problem that we have been interested in? Solar interfaces. So, how you put together a material that absorbs light with an electrolyte, some kind of dirty water, and a catalyst, so that the charges that are created by sunlight give rise to the chemical reaction that you want. Actually, this is a very difficult problem and largely unsolved for many of, of the materials that we know today. And we have uncovered descriptors to guide the experiment and un, uh, 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 understood key several characteristics of optimal photoelectrodes. And in another, you know, for materials that are not too dissimilar to one that you would use in electrochemical cells, we have understood how defects how modifying these, as these are oxygen vacancies for, for the extracts, uh, how moving them in a certain way can give rise to actually a transition that you can harness uh, for a material that behave a little bit like a synapsis. And uh, the reason why I chose to, these two pictures, which represent two studies uh, you know, conducted over the years, is that the descriptors that we have come up with did guide experiments. And it's very important also to point out the prediction were verified after the fact experimentally. So our theoretical uh, 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 strategies are indeed predictive. Maybe not always, but in this case, uh, they were. Okay, so before going to tell you all the people that did the work, uh, I want to finish with a, a sentence uh, borrowed from somebody that I've had uh, the fortune to interact on and off uh, during the years, actually, and uh, this is uh, Professor Mildred Dresselhaus. And uh, Mildred was uh, the, the, the referee of my first paper on carbon, and this was 1989. I had just arrived in Urbana-Champaign uh, from Italy, and actually she called me up. You know, this were a different day. I said, oh, I, I've got your paper to referee, and, and she told me what, what she thought about my paper, and some, some of the things were good, some not, not, not that good, but, uh, you know, she was very helpful. 
And uh, I've, I've seen her uh, at a meeting that we were uh, uh, actually at together a few, few months be- before she passed. And this sentence, which is, by the way, also up there in, in, in the academy, I can really relate to. And science is changing every day, but I'm changing with it, and I try to be right there. And this is uh, uh, something that, as I said, I can very much relate to. So I cannot list all the people and all my students, but I, I, I'm, I've thought that I would you know, show some pictures. These are pictures of my groups over the years, and they are very important to me. These are people that contributed enormously uh, to my career and uh, to what I told you about. Uh, in Livermore first, what I started, then University of California, Davis, and uh, now at the University of Chicago and uh, uh, Argonne National Lab, and of course my collaborators, and of course funding agencies. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>